You are listening to Single Serves. My name is Arno Marchere and I am your host. Single Serves is a podcast dealing with design, architecture, business, and city building in which I interview an expert on a specific subject matter. Together, we dive into that topic and challenge conventional thinking in a thought-provoking conversation. For our inaugural season, we have some great guests lined up and you can expect to hear about such topics like social media for architects, organizational culture, criticism in media, and architects not practicing architecture, among many others. I sincerely hope that you will find these conversations as engaging as I did and learn a thing or two in the process. Don't forget to send us your comments, criticism, and praise. To do so, you can email us at hello at rvltr.studio or leave a comment online. You can also subscribe to the podcast on our website at rvltr.studio and follow us on social media under the handle at revelator underscore T-O. It's R-E-V-E-L-A-T-E-U-R underscore T-O. So today we have Gordon Grice with us to talk about risk. Thanks, Gordon, for being on the show. It's my pleasure, Arno. So let's jump right in the questions. How did you come in contact with risk? To give a little bit of context, we're talking about risk in the architecture world. Through my career, I've been in, been exposed to risk many, many times, but I never thought about it like most creative people don't. Recently, within the last uh, 18 months, I've had a project with an insurance company, and insurance is all about risk, professional risk in particular. It got me thinking of just about how risk affects everything we do as creative professionals. So why would you say architecture is risky? Well, architecture is risky at, at many levels. To begin with, any creative profession is a risky business because you're putting your ideas out there. Sometimes you're pushing the envelope. Sometimes you're trying out ideas that may not have been tried out before. So you're taking a chance. And uh, at the worst, you might face ridicule or rejection. At the best, you might get some satisfaction out of it. But the thing about architecture is that it involves not just the artistic risk, but it also involves physical risk. And you're dealing with people's money. You're dealing with heavy machinery. You're dealing with buildings that may cause problems for people, God forbid. So you have to, you have a huge responsibility to protect people uh, when you're an architect that you might not have if you're a sculptor or a painter. How do architects typically manage and or mitigate risk? Let's start with the positive. Architects are required to have insurance against errors and omissions that they might make. They're required to have that insurance, the same as you have to have insurance if you drive a car, because you might cause harm to other people, and you don't want that to happen. So that's the first thing. But I think in terms of things like uh, what you might call aesthetic risk, I think that architects sometimes don't take it as seriously as they ought to. There's, there's a large uh, temptation or compulsion in some cases to create objects and spaces that are exciting to some people and unexciting to other people. Lately, I've been re doing some research into the idea of the architecture of discomfort, which is how architects can create uh, things intentionally or unintentionally that are uncomfortable. The unintentional part is that by trying to accomplish something artistically, you might accomplish something that is offensive aesthetically. Other thing about it is that you sometimes can use discomfort to a certain end. For example, making people go around things when they would rather go through things. So basically, I think the idea of risk as it applies to architecture is that there are many levels of risk. So it's not just financial or personal injury. A lot of it has to do with aesthetic and cultural risk. What that makes me think of is you said there's aesthetic risk. You can take chances in designing buildings that doesn't function the way it would typically be thought of, but maybe that's, that's a way to create innovative programs and adjacencies or plans that didn't exist before. There's the idea of making a space uncomfortable on purpose. Like you see a lot in the art world, it's not uncommon to see an art exhibit from an artist whose mission is to make you uncomfortable in a space. Do you have a way to break down those levels of risk? Because we, we can talk about this on so many different levels, it's almost confusing. How do you approach that issue? In terms of the kind of risk that uh, we insure ourselves against, I'm not an expert in that. I've only been exposed to this for a short while, but I find it fascinating. In terms of other forms of risk, which have to do with taking chances on uh, getting out of the envelope, all artists, and you mentioned performance art, and that's a great example because a lot of performance art has to do with making people feel a little bit a queasy, you know, a little bit edgy, a little bit uncomfortable. There's a thing called um, 
benign masochism. And benign masochism is where you crave things that hurt, but they hurt in a really good way, as in the song, it hurts so good. So, and that's pervasive. You know, that's something that people seek. So in that sense, making people uncomfortable in the art world is, is a good thing. And it, it works very well in architecture as well. The problem with architecture is that sometimes it's inadvertent. You don't do it on purpose. And I think that's something that you have to be aware of. My point about it is that if you're going to make people uncomfortable, understand, first of all, what it is that makes them comfortable, know the rules before you break, and then use it constructively. I want to go back to something you've mentioned a couple of minutes ago. You said architects, and I'm paraphrasing, have a responsibility or a duty to ensure that what they do is not harmful. So where do you draw the line between just taking risk and going too far. And again, if we go back to all the ways an architect can take risk in designing a building, it can be aesthetic, it can be from a usage perspective. Who's the authority? Well, that's a good question because it uh, it varies. You know, it's, it's impossible to know. I think you need to consider as many of the factors as you possibly can. You know, the, the whole thing about the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, I think that definitely applies to all the professions. In architecture, you're, you're, you're kind of encouraged to take certain kind of risks, but to avoid other kinds of risks. And I can... I can tell you that in, in the insurance business, probably unique to other insurers, the firm that I consult to, they go out of their way to try to inform architects about how to avoid risks. They don't, they don't want you to end up in court. They're not going to make any money that way. You know, and it, besides, it's your money that they're spending. So you want to try very, very hard not to not to harm people or not to have them suffer some kind of financial loss, which is another another way of taking risks. I th I think the main thing is to just try and consider all of the risks that you might be about to take, and somehow figure out a way not to take them. It's an interesting thought. I keep going back to a building that I've experienced personally, and I'm not going to name the building because I went to a school that had a building designed by, uh, for all intents and purposes, the architects. And, and that building is still to this day lauded for it being daring, being a daring design. But it's a building that's absolutely horrible to live in. It doesn't work. It's always uncomfortable. There's nothing special about the spaces, cl the classrooms, the studio spaces. There's nothing about it that, that makes it particularly pleasant to be in. Quite the contrary. It's just some places are highly uncomfortable. And it always puzzled me to think that an architect could be praised for a daring design, but that utterly failed to meet the basic requirements of comfort. And that's a risk in itself, but it's also something that the architecture community doesn't talk a lot about, if at all, or the few people who do talk about kind of shout about it in an empty room and nobody really cares about it. So what's your opinion on that? I agree with you that it's not frequently discussed. I think getting back again to what architects are encouraged to, to do, they're very often encouraged by their client to, to do those things. And certainly uh, the building you're talking about was encouraged by the client because of the use of that building. They wanted something that reflected the, the innovative nature of the building use. Uh, there's another one not far away on Blurs. And similarly, it was really intended to arouse interest. Get somebody who's a really good architect. That particular architect has won many prizes and continues to win prizes. Make him design something that will get people's interests. Basically, I don't care if they like it or they hate it, but they need to talk about it. That way we're going to raise money and we're, you know, we're going to... I would argue this is the architecture equivalent of reality TV. You just put something outrageous out there that will get people either completely hooked on some fake story that was written by some writer or so angry because they find it so distasteful but once the show is over there's nothing left yeah I, you know I agree with your assessment of reality TV but uh, I mean the huge difference is that if you don't like the program you can turn it off architecture you don't have that advantage and that's arguably even worse because now you leave whoever paid the bill with something that they got to deal with for decades to come right well to, to take it back to the idea of risk again consider the uh, current controversy about the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. And there's no danger that the building is going to fall down and crush anybody. There doesn't appear to be any physical risk, but taking the project on in the first place was an extremely risky venture. It was kind of a, a no-win situation. You were going to try and do something that you, you couldn't possibly duplicate or replicate what's there now. You had to do something new. And you have to do it in an extremely conservative community. And you're putting it next to a historic landmark. What are you going to do? So can you um, backtrack just a second and give us a little bit of context on that project? Right. Well, okay. So this is an addition to the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa, which is an old railway hotel, 100 and some odd years old, right? And the idea was that they needed to extend it, bring it up to date. So they hired architects who were fairly highly regarded and guaranteed to do a pretty good job. And the architects took the project very, very seriously. So they presented something that is has a much more modern context to it. The one thing I think that stands out as in all modern architecture that people dislike is that it has a flat roof. 
You know, if somebody builds a house on your street with a flat roof, that's not cool, but it happens all the time. But beyond being a, having a flat roof, it's it's kind of very, it uses modern materials in a modern way. Functionally, I haven't really looked at it carefully, but functionally, I assume it works quite well. There's no way that the good citizens of Ottawa are going to just sit back and let it you know, some brand new building be pasted on the side of their... Uh... So how does that relate to the idea of risk and what's the solution? The risk is that you're taking on a project that is going to put you in the hot seat as an architect. And very often architects do that. This was a particularly risky project because of where it is and what it is. And how you solve that problem? You just soldier through it. You know, the I think the architects have been very good at defending their decisions and at sticking with it, trying to listen to concerns, but you can't please everybody all the time. So... Well, I guess sticking back your ideas is a risk in itself because you always risk alienating people. And you know, a lot of the discussion has to do with appearances. And we, we talk about the fact that architecture, it's really about space as much as it's about form. So the question you want to ask is how do the spaces perform? Certainly many, many more people are going to walk by it than ever go through it. So form of the thing is important. But to get back to a project I mentioned earlier on Bloor Street, that has alienated a lot of people. It was risky for the museum to take it on. Uh, I'm not sure that the architect felt it was risky because it's what he does all the time, but it's created a lot of controversy, and controversy is a good thing. Having been inside the building on the ground floor, very disappointing. On the upper floor, it's amazing. So there are spaces within that building that I think justify the form that it takes, and there are spaces that don't. That's an interesting take on that building. I've heard maybe a few years ago there were talks about tearing it down to build another addition. Is I haven't heard of that, no. I do know that there have been talks about tearing other offensive buildings down, but not that one. Let's go back to, to what you do in the risk world. How does insurance, in the case of architecture, deal with risk? Well, this is probably something that should be discussed by an insurance professional, not a, uh, not a writer, an editor. The important thing about it, and I, I go back to this again, is that we do everything we can to keep architects out of trouble. I think, generally speaking, the architectural insurance is viewed as a necessary evil but an evil nonetheless. I think that specifically it is viewed as a constant source of disappointment because that's basically what insurance is. For me, insurance is a strange form of gambling where you gamble against yourself. So if you win the bet, something terrible happens and you don't lose very much. So that's, you, you come out of it okay. You might lose, but you don't lose very much. If you lose the bet, you put all that money in and nothing happens. So you've lost all of the premiums that you paid. It might be thousands and thousands of dollars. So. So you've lost your money because nothing terrible has happened. The worst is not taking the bet at all. Because if you don't take the bet at all, you could be completely destroyed. It's a strange kind of gamble. And the thing about taking the bet and putting the money into insurance and nothing terrible ever happens is that what you win is a sense of relaxation, comfort, in that if something terrible does happen, that you, you won't lose your business, you won't, you, know, you won't be totally ruined. Um, I think that's a... So it got me thinking about insurance in those terms in the past that I never really had, you know. Um, so I've always understood insurance as the pooling of risk and or the spreading the risk across a large pool of people. Because if you get thousands of people covered under the same insurance and only a small fraction of those make a claim, then the insurance can still make money and everybody's covered. And it's based on the probability of something happening. Is that true? Is that the way it works? Yeah, th that's exactly how it works, except with co many complications. Chief among the complications are are what you're insured against and what you're not insured against. So you might think, oh, I'm cool, you know, I'm, I'm covered, only to discover that you're not. So that's that's kind of, I think, the biggest complication. Insurance started out that way. The Great Fire of London, which was about 300 years ago, was when insurance changed because prior to that, it basically was a pool. You had a bad year, you didn't have any grain, you know, the crop, your crops failed. Well, you had a pool that people would help you out. In London, prior to the Great Fire, what would happen is, I mean, they had open fires, everything was built out of wood. So if you had a fire in your shop, the other guys would get together and help you build it up again, and you put your back on your feet. What happened with the Great Fire of London, the most, the most recent, I think it's the most recent one, because um, there was one in the 13th century as well, but in the one that was in the 17th century? Yeah, I think that's what it was. It destroyed thousands of buildings, and uh, something like a, a large percentage of Londoners were left homeless. So, uh oh they had to figure out some other way of doing this. And so the fir first fire brigade started at that point, and then the idea of modern insurance also rose up. Fire insurance, for example, wasn't pooling things anymore. Now it was having a pool specifically for that purpose, and having somebody in charge of it as a business, and running it as a business. Yeah, because in their interest to insure buildings that are not as fire prone so then they can say oh we want you to build it out of stone instead of wood so what do insurance companies know that we don't about insuring um, architects 
We take risks in various ways, and the way we mitigate those risks are that we take polls, we do research. So at the base of risk is uncertainty, okay? So uncertainty is the thing, and there's no way of eliminating uncertainty. You know, I talk about, for example, if you're a, a fatalist, then uncertainty doesn't bother you and risk doesn't bother you because whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It's not up to you at all. If you're not a fatalist, then you are constantly exposed to risk. And you can increase your risk by playing the horses or by backing a political candidate or playing the stock market. There's many, many things you can do. Um, so in order to lessen that risk, you you take, you, like I said, you take polls, you do research. If you're an insurance company, you have, uh, you have adjusters and you have actuaries. And actuaries are the people that figure out exactly what the odds are, as close as they can. Can't be perfect, but as close as they can. And the trick is not to, to remove uncertainty, but to remove more uncertainty than other people have. If you're playing the horses, what you want to do is remove more uncertainty than the bookies and the other bettors have. So you can't be sure. Your horse could go lame at the starting gate. You don't know. But in the long run, maybe over, you know, over time, there's a good chance that you might make your money back. So it's like the idea of a group of people being charged by a grizzly bear, and it's not about outrunning the bear, it's about outrunning the other people. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> so insurance companies try to figure out what the odds are and charge accordingly. And they pay very, very smart people a lot of money to help them do that. So you've kind of touched on that, but I still want to ask that question just because I think it's interesting. Is it possible to not take any risk? I guess in, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, being in the architecture business. Yeah. So avoiding risk is impossible. So let's, let's kind of put that. Aside. You can't. Being born is a risk. And that risk continues until the time you're not alive anymore. So life is risky. Even if you try to avoid it, you can stay home and a satellite could fall on your house. You know, it's... There's no, there's no way of avoiding risk as long as you're around. As an architect, you want to know how to avoid risk. I think the only thing, you have to assess your, your motives for doing things, and I think you have to assess your methods for doing things. I made some points about what I think the important things about risk are as they apply to architecture. The first thing is that it's unavoidable. It exists everywhere all the time. So don't think you can, you can ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist. You can dismiss it if you're a fatalist. You can minimize it. Or in some cases, not necessarily on architecture, although it happens sometimes, you can embrace it. It really makes you feel good. So if you're a parasailer or a base jumper, that's a way of embracing risk. Or a motorcyclist. Or a motorcyclist, yeah. And that's very interesting because it's actually something that I've been talking a lot. I've just mentioned earlier that I, I took a long motorcycle trip. And being on a motorcycle is, I'm going to deviate a little bit just to get back to the topic later, but or any kind of risky activity It's that constant tension between this paradox of something that's exhilarating or exciting or adrenaline uh, generating and very risky at the same time. And I think that tension makes us feel alive. So I think I'm going to speak for myself, but I think taking risks and probably more risk than the average person is kind of a way for me to feel alive, but not as in in a reckless way, it's more like it reminds me of my own vulnerability and, and mortality in some sense. This makes me happy to be alive. And yes, there's an inherent risk, but you've talked about this a few minutes ago. You can also mitigate the risk if you maintain your bike well, if you don't go like crazy in the rain, if you don't weave between cars and rush hour traffic. So there's lots of ways if you wear the proper gear, which a lot of people don't, sadly. I think taking risk is also valuable. And I guess we each take risks to our own level of comfort, but it's also very valuable in, in as a source of innovation and progress almost because uh, that tension between safety and or whatever the joy that activity brings and the risk it bears is very inspiring from a creative perspective. There's a, uh, there's a physical component to that too when you're on a bike and you feel the wind in your hair, you know, that, except you're wearing a helmet, but you, f you feel the breeze going past. You can feel the road underneath you, you know, at the very least. Um, the, the distinction is, in a lot of cases, whether it's just you that you're putting at risk. If you're also putting other people at risk, and sometimes on a motorbike you are, but certainly in uh, the professions you definitely are. You're putting a lot of people at risk. So those are the things that you have to assess more carefully. Getting back to your idea of personal risk and feeling alive, I, I relate to that a lot. A job that I had before this was working for a company that designs theme parks. I developed an affection for thrill rides. And so one of those, obviously, are uh, roller coasters. There's a brand new one at uh, Canada's Wonderland that I have not tried yet, but I can't wait. Doing a little bit of research into roller coasters and the appeal that they have for people, we talked about benign masochism earlier. I 
Well, there's another thing called hedonic reversal. So hedonism is is when uh, pleasure is the greatest accomplishment or is the highest the highest goal. Hedonic reversal is when it's a form of masochism where pleasure is directly inversely related to the degree of pain that you feel. So a good example of this is eating hot peppers. You know, they have this Schofield scale. It starts at something like 20 and then at the, at the other end is something like 300,000 or something like that. I have friends who like who like to tempt themselves by eating hot peppers. And the greater delight comes, the hotter the pepper is. The more discomfort it creates, the more fun you have. The curious thing about the hedonic reversal thing is that the curve is not a smooth curve. So uh, for many things in life, there's a flat curve, it's not much fun, then it gets more and more dangerous, and it's more fun, and then it gets more dangerous. And then you reach a point where you're not enjoying it so much, so then it starts to curve down again. In hedonic reversal, it gets better and better and better. The worse it gets, it gets better and better, until it reaches a point where you can't tolerate it anymore. And then the curve drops. It's a steep drop, and that's the end of it. So as long as it's tolerable, it's pleasurable. This has probably nothing to do with architecture. I've got to think about it. But it <laughs> certainly has something to do with uh, roller coasters. I think there will be roller coasters that you go on where you go, my god, this is incredible. And then another roller coaster you might go on, although I've never been on one of these, where you go, that's it. I can't do this. Roller coasters are a very calculated risk because they're probably way over engineered and, and super safe. I can tell you, I've, se I've seen the way these things are engineered and they are, I mean, they, they, you know, they put your BMW to shame. Yeah, and there's probably like re multiple redundancies and safety. But when you're in the coaster, right, and you're going through this, uh, this up upset, this, this um, you know, your proprioceptive system is on high alert. Yeah. It says, what the hell are you doing? Are you insane? We're all going to die just for a second and a half. So there, there was another, another phrase that I got, a word that I got from a German um, theme park uh, person, and it's angstlust. And the German word angstlust is just what it sounds like. It's a lust for angst you know in the end that it's probably going to be okay. Like there's 99.9% .9 chance, but it doesn't deter you from wanting this sense of oxygen. So it's almost about tricking the brain into thinking you're going to die, even though you know rationally that you're not going to. It doesn't involve much trickery either. You know, as you approach the roller coaster, there's the sound of people screaming. Why are they screaming? They don't sound happy. They sound like they're terrified. Of course, the screams are recorded and they're played over the, uh, the lineup. Oh, is that what it is? Yes. <laughs> in every roller coaster? I can't say that for sure, but in many. I mean, because you're on the roller coaster and you can hear the screams. So if they're not fabricated, they're amplified to the point where much greater than they are. So that's literally like a Disneyland approach to risk, right? Make it exhilarating, but safe at the same time. Probably. that. So the comparison between that and architecture would be, I suppose, to make things feel edgy, feel exciting for those who want to be excited, but to pose absolutely no danger at all. Um, if you're talking about aesthetic risk, I suppose it's a, it's a similar kind of thing to be to, to push it out there, to make it seem unusual, but not offensive. Because it almost m makes it look like it's all fakery. When, we, when you present it that way, yeah. as opposed to, I mean, you don't want a building to fall on people. That would be terrible. But how does one not take too much risk due to overconfidence? If you're overconfident, you're not watching. You know, you're not, uh, if you think, well, I can do anything. Well, I have to break it to you. You can't do anything. When it comes down to professions like architecture, where there's always the danger that by being confident, you might be overconfident. You might actually be alienating the people that you're trying to impress. So architects are kind of notorious, uh, going back to uh, Gary Cooper and the Fountainhead, you know, Ayn Rand, that uh, they have a degree of arrogance. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not true, but architects have not gone far enough out of the way to dispel that myth because when it, when it comes up and an architect sees that people are admiring him, for, not just architects, I mean, musicians are guilty of this too, that they don't mind it so much, you know. They should mind it because it, it's not good for the profession. That's a, a different discussion. But if, if you become overconfident and you lose track of what it is you're trying to do and who you're trying to do it for, then yes, you're, you're in grave danger. So there should be somebody standing beside you that kind of tugs on your sleeve and says, hey, can I speak to you for a minute? I would venture out and say that those who are portrayed or perceived as being arrogant, like you said, don't necessarily mind it because it's part of their image, right? I'm sure you've heard that story of uh, Frank Gehry flipping the finger at someone a few years ago and, uh, and saying that 99% of architecture is pure shit, um, which can arguably be supported in some way. Um, 
but that's arrogance but he can get away with it because he's so well known right yeah yeah uh yeah i think you know i think probably he doesn't really believe that i think he was i, I wasn't there but it sounds like he was goaded into making that remark because it's not true obviously i don't think he thinks it's true but i i think he was trying to wake architects up a little bit to a to something that he believes but n not necessarily something we should all believe Talk about risk and climate change, because I think that's a very big topic right now. And specifically from the angle of uh, insurance, how do you foresee insurance changing as a result of a different environment we have to deal with? Yeah, well, I can tell you that change is afoot. Uh, but I can't tell you. I don't know what those changes are. There is an insurance, a thing called catastrophic, where what happens places such a drain on the insurance pool that it can't possibly recover. So that's a catastrophic risk. And uh, those things can happen, but they don't happen very often. But the problem with, uh, with uh, the situation with wildfires and rising waters is that they have the potential for posing a ca catastrophic risk. Um, there are always reinsurers and other insurance companies who are, who are not destroyed by whatever the catastrophic risk might be. Certainly, the dangers of fire and water are are such that they do pose catastrophic risks going forward, and I'm not sure how insurance deals with those. For architects, um, obviously, they've kind of pulled up their socks and they're 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 addressing the the whole thing about. Uh, can it be said that those risks can be mitigated by the very design, in that uh, you can design for a thousand or million year flood or the worst possible wildfire? Yeah, you can. Uh, of course, it adds to the cost, and I think maybe that's that, that's certainly one of the things that has to be pursued. I'm thinking about the uh, the design uh, standards in San Francisco, for example, where tall buildings are built on ball bearings, so that when the earth shakes, they kind of roll back and forth. And it's a phenomenal idea. There's a building, and it's got this little uh, moat around it, and that moat is what allows the building to wobble back and forth when the earth shakes. Now, it's quite possible that there will be an earthquake that's too great. But in the meantime, they're going to get through a lot of... Uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Old buildings aren't built that way, right? So they're, they're more in danger than you. Well, if it gets to the point where that insane earthquake happens, yeah. nothing else will be standing, so it won't really matter, right? right. Um, but that's a very interesting thought. So it, it brings me back to the book, The Black Swan by uh, Nassim Taleb. Have you ever read that? He talks a lot about massive risks that cannot be predicted, yeah. uh, which is what he called a black swan event. Um, and I think this this has a lot to do with uh, so the crisis of 2008 was one of those, and that we are in a, we live in a society that's increasingly more exposed to those black swan risks because we uh, we are overconfident in our ability to basically survive. This was your question about overconfidence. Uh, I, th I think it has some of it. So it just brings me back. I think if people want to explore that idea further, I highly recommend the book. It can get a little technical at times, but it's it's still written for the layman, and it's very, very interesting, and I think you might be interested in it as well. He's written five or six books on, not just on risk and overconfidence, but he talks a lot about those things. Is he um, a, 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 I mean, what's is he? So a, he's a former trader, uh, and he made a lot of money betting against um, what everybody else was doing, made enough of what he calls fuck you money, and retired and became a writer and wrote all these books and he's now also a professor and it's very interesting i think it dovetails perfectly in this conversation so we're getting towards the end of the conversation but what's the the biggest risk that you've personally taken i've led a fairly risk-free life going on roller coasters as you pointed out is not really that risky you know i've had three kids so that's fairly risky i've changed careers five or six times but i've tried to do that in a risk risk-free way yeah. Can you point out to anything specific that stands out? Any event in my life? Uh, no, I almost drowned on a on a whitewater raft one time, but it was over so fast, and I was back up in the raft again that I only think about it afterwards. Oh my God, I could have died! But it didn't seem risky at the time. We were just going for a whitewater ride. What could happen? Well, that's a risky activity in itself. It is, but you know, again, you you just like on a roller coaster, you think, well, you've got two experts on board, you've got the life vest on, you've got the crash helmet on. Uh, what could go wrong? Well, what can go wrong is you can get stuck underneath the raft and not get up again. That's what can go wrong. But they don't, they don't dwell on that, right? Yeah. I guess that's the word of caution for today. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your time. I think it was a very interesting conversation, and I look forward to the next one. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. 
Hey Arno here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll come back for more. Please share with your friends and colleagues and remember to subscribe on our website at rvltr.studio. Follow us on social media at revelator underscore T-O. It's R-E-V-E-L-A-T-E-U-R underscore T-O. Until next time, ciao.